more traditional women rushed to support the boys at the front. In 1914 alone, the Imperial Order of the Daughters of the Empire helped fund a naval ship, a hospital wing, and many ambulances. Women of all backgrounds rolled endless band bandages and knitted countless socks for soldiers in the trenches. Many well-meaning middle-class women were active in the Canadian Patriotic Fund, which provided charity to the wives of soldiers. But again, some of these initiatives actually provoked splits and revealed sharp class differences. Most women did not work in munitions factories. Those that did complained of 12-hour shifts, night work, a six-day week, and difficult working conditions. Rhetoric about sacrifice and the common good wore thin quite fast. A group of these women factory workers asked the Toronto Star to publicize their grievances. Quote, they are killing us off as fast as they are killing men at the trenches. Similarly, many of the women who volunteered to replace men as agricultural laborers, freeing the men once again to go overseas, found themselves living in tents far from home in insanitary conditions. But their complaints rarely reached the public. So much of the propaganda about women being liberated during the First World War to take unconventional jobs was propaganda. But it was all part of the national effort. Canadian women were urged to sign up as VADs, Voluntary Aid Detachment, and to tell their men to go and fight for king and country. Yet most working women did remain in traditional female jobs, in textile and garment factories, for instance, where pay rates were substantially below men's earnings.